having everybody come in. Oh, I believe we are live on Facebook. Excellent. Do a double check. Yes, we are live. Wonderful. Great. We'll give just a few more seconds to make sure everybody is in uh, from the waiting room on Zoom. Hello. 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 We are so happy to have you here today. Welcome to Hello. the Augusta Heritage Center virtually. Yes. I'm going to hand it over to Seth. I'll keep admitting people, Seth. OK. Welcome, everybody, uh, to the virtual Augusta Heritage Center fall um, season of cultural sessions, concerts, and music making events. Um, we've been very happy and privileged to complete the work that we have during this trying time um, in keeping our communities connected and engaged throughout the duration of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we have just an absolutely fabulous session in store tonight. Um, Dr. Wilkinson, I'll, I'll let Emily introduce him, but we just did some reminiscing uh, from the CAC because I too attended WVU and, and fondly remember uh, his lectures in the recital hall. Before we get started, I'd like to remind everybody that these sessions are generously sponsored by the National Endowment for the Arts, the West Virginia Department of Arts, Culture and History, the West Virginia Humanities Council, and Davis Elkins College. We're also sponsored by you, the Augusta faithful that have uh, given us the most in our time of need through this uh, trying time here. Uh, we've had over 500 individual sponsors since we were forced to shut down in-person operations and pivot into um, virtual programming. I would like to, I'm happy to announce that we're having a, another session, much like the one we did this summer. Uh, we're having a winter season where we're having 25 artists, each teaching three lessons and doing a robust series of humanities events. Uh, they will be teaching everything from blues to bluegrass, to early country to gospel, and each instructor will teach a lesson that is a beginning level lesson, intermediate, and advanced level lesson. This is also a week of celebration at the Augusta Heritage Center, for this is October old time. And uh, we're here to kick it off with Dr. Wilkinson tonight, but it rolls on throughout the week. Tomorrow, we're going to have an awesome round robin. This is a concert with our modern masters. That would be Rachel Eddy, Ben Townsend, Brad Kolodner, Aaron Marshall, Carl Jones, and Emily Shad. The night after that, Thursday evening, we'll be uh, partnering with uh, um, Rachel Eddy and Emily, oh shoot, Emily's last name. I don't have any notes. I'm just- Hammond. Going. Emily Hammond. Yes. Um, they will be hosting an old time jam from their home. That will be on YouTube and also our Facebook page. Friday, we're having a participant song swap. So if you, um, play old time music or sing traditional songs, we would love for you to uh, join our Zoom session and share those with the rest of the participants. Those will not be broadcast live on Facebook. That is just a house party for us at Augusta. If you don't have the Zoom link and you're not receiving our emails, you can email me at Augusta Heritage Center at dwv.edu and I'll be happy to get you those links. In fact, I'll put it in the chat once we get started here. Saturday, we're going to live premiere a, we've been digging in the archives. I'm very happy to announce that we have begun just today running tape through the machines and digitizing the Augusta archive. That actually the rubber hit the road this afternoon on that. Um, with the help of Folk Arts Coordinator Emeritus Jerry Milnes, our AmeriCorps Hannah Fuller went through and pulled some of the uh, Fiddlers, West Virginia Fiddle Masters from Fiddlers Reunion Past. We're putting together a series, an overview of what that event has been like um, in the past. And that will premiere on YouTube Saturday evening at seven o'clock. If you'd like to hear more, 
You can like us on Facebook, Instagram. You can join our Facebook group, Augusta, um, Learn, Create, Connect. Or you can email me at Augusta Heritage Center, and uh, I'll put you on a list to receive more information when that time comes. So I'll put a lot of this in the chat, um, so don't bother writing it down just yet. And uh, while I do that, I'm going to turn it over to our artistic director, Emily Miller, uh, to introduce this session. Hello, everyone. Such a pleasure to be here this evening with you all. And I'm especially excited to be presenting um, Dr. Christopher Wilkinson. Um, he, uh, Dr. Wilkinson was a music history professor at WVU for um, many years, 37 years. <laughs> And um, he, well, he's, he taught since 1976 and has been a professor emeritus, which is a very lovely title um, since 2013. He taught um, the history, is especially interested in the history of jazz and the history of art music from a multicultural perspective. And I was first uh, turned on to Dr. Wilkinson's work through his wonderful book entitled Big Band Jazz in Black West Virginia, which, um, is also the title of this lecture this evening. And, I, and we are gonna learn a really interesting and detailed history of jazz in this in the mountain state. And I think many of you who um, are tuning into this, like me, um, like many people who have enjoyed the Augusta Heritage Center productions are interested in all in the great diversity of music that has thrived in the mountain state. Um, and so this is especially exciting um, to be able to, uh, to take part in this with Dr. Wilkinson. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Chris. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. I do want to begin by thanking Emily and Seth for their support of this and Emily's idea in the first place. Uh, it was most welcome. This is a subject that I've been studying and thinking about for about 18 years. Uh, that is the subject of the musical culture of big band jazz and dance music among black mountaineers in the years of the Great Depression, leading up to the beginning of World War II. Now, perhaps like many of you, I am somewhat new to Zoom and even newer to the idea of talk. I talk on Zoom. There may be some rough patches technically, but Emily and I have rehearsed a bit so I think we can keep those to a minimum. Now, as a point of information, I am sitting in my study here in Morgantown. Emily, when she first saw it approved, saying it looked professorial, which <laughs> I think is a very polite way of saying messy, but there it is. That would be true. Now, I'm going to talk for no more than 50 minutes. I have a timer on my cell phone that should enable me to bring this home in time, even though I love the sound of my own voice. Seth and Emily are going to be between them monitoring the chat room. And after I conclude, we should have plenty of time for questions. And I hope you will not hold off on questions if they come to mind. Now, my presentation will be divided into three parts. First of all, how I came to the subject. Second of all, a brief history of the world of black mountaineers before the 1930s followed by a discussion of some of the forces at work that made their embrace of big bands possible in the 1930s. And finally, an overview of the musical culture of big band jazz and dance music among black West Virginians, including how they learned of this music that originated far from West Virginia in Northern cities, how they responded to the music and which bands in fact toured the state. Now to begin, what led me to this subject? It was in 1997 or 1998, while working on a biography of a New Orleans born trumpet player and band leader named Don Albert, that I was sitting in the reference department of the Institute of Texan Culture in San Antonio. Now among the resources for my biography were a number of recorded interviews, oral histories with musicians who'd played in Albert's band, as well as others who had known him in other stages of his life. Among those, most of these interviews, let me add, were preserved in New Orleans at the Hogan Jazz Archive of Tulane University. 
but there were a handful in San Antonio and I was determined to listen to all of them. Now among those whose memories I heard was a man named Herbert Hall, who was a clarinetist and baritone saxophonist in the band and who like Don Albert himself had come to San Antonio from New Orleans and who like Albert had put down roots there. He was interviewed by a newspaper man who'd become interested in hearing the stories of older black musicians from San Antonio and vicinity and recorded those conversations for posterity. Now, as we are gonna zoom in here and we'll get a look at Mr. Hall as a young man, he is right here. He was interviewed by a man named Sterling Holmesley who wrote for the San Antonio Express News in 1980. This photograph dates from 1935. So he has uh, much time will have passed uh, before that interview. Now, Sterling Holmesley asked Herb Hall where the band had toured, where Don Albert's band had toured. And to assist Hall's recollections, he began reciting states moving north and east from Texas. After confirming that the Albert Band had toured in a number of states, in fact, almost all of the states east of the Mississippi, except for New England, he asked Hall another question. He asked if the Don Albert's orchestra had ever battled another band. A battle describes a setting in which two bands uh, alternated performances in a dance venue and the audience determined by its applause which band was the better one. This tradition of battling incidentally not, is traceable back to West Africa and I can explain that in the Q&A should anyone be interested. Um, and Hall thought for a moment and said the only place he recalls battles taking place was West Virginia because as he put it, Now to me, to be perfectly honest, this statement seemed utterly counterintuitive. West Virginia in many people's mind and certainly in mine when I heard this is associated un with unemployment, underemployment, rural poverty and all of the consequences thereof. For Hall to make this claim about one of the worst periods in the nation's economic history seemed to me utterly incomprehensible. I wanted to know more so after finishing the Don Albert biography, I turned to the subject of my talk today, if only to see if I could validate his recollection or confirmed my original unexamined assumptions. He was right, and I will demonstrate why. But let's begin with a little prehistory of Black West Virginians from the end of the Civil War to the period of the Great Depression. I'm taking up this topic because it will give you an idea of the world in which big band jazz and dance music would be introduced. The census of 1860 was the last one prior to the Civil War and thus the last one prior to West Virginia's emergence as a state, the 35th state in 1863. It revealed that the number of blacks residing in Western Virginia, as we might refer to it then, totaled slightly more than 21,000. A little more than 18,000 were enslaved, the rest were free, something like 2,773, 2,773 free Blacks. The 1870 census showed a drop in the Black population of the state, which is not surprising for the first thing that many freedmen, women, and children did was to go in search of new lives far from the sites of their former enslavement. But by 1880, the black population of West Virginia began to grow again and would continue to rise through the census of 1940. The most immediate reason being employment, opportunities, building railroads and mining coal. Now, most of this population came from neighboring states, Southwestern Virginia, North Carolina and South Carolina, specifically the Piedmont regions of the Carolinas as well as in a few instances, Ohio and Alabama. When I mentioned they came to build the railroads, 
that opened up the state's southern coal fields, I'm referring specifically to three. First, the Chesapeake and Ohio, now of course has morphed into CSX. The Norfolk and Western Railway, which we now know as Norfolk Southern, and the Virginian Railway, the least of the three, which was subsequently absorbed by the Norfolk and Western and Chesapeake and Ohio before all these other mergers took place. Approximately 5,000 African Americans built the CNO, and a similar number, the NNW. Smaller numbers built the Virginian. Once the railroads were completed, their black workforces either continued to work <coughs> for the railroads or worked in the mines which those railroads served. Collectively, miners and railroad workers con constituted the vast majority of the black working class in the state. They were joined by more formally educated African Americans who taught in the segregated schools, were doctors, lawyers, religious leaders, and owners of a wide variety of businesses. Now, as to where Black Mountaineers lived, the 1930 census revealed that the 114,000 Black residents of the state, recall that there were just 21,000 in 1860, were concentrated primarily in two areas of intensive mining. These are the coal fields to which I will refer. This is the northern coal field, and you see it consists of a total of six counties. The southern coal field is considerably more extensive. I should say coal fields. There are four of them by some definitions. The counties highlighted in white in each of the northern and southern coal field territories were where the greater majority of African Americans resided. The three counties of the northern coal fields, that includes Monongalia, where Morgantown and I are located, Marion and Harrison, as well as six counties in the southern coal fields, Kanaw, that's how it's pronounced, you folks from out of state, Kanaw, Fayette, Raleigh, Mercer, McDowell, not McDowell, McDowell, and Logan. Those were home to the far larger numbers, far more African Americans lived in the southern coal fields than in the north. In fact, 75% of the state's black population in the period of the 1930s lived in just three of those counties, Kanaw, Raleigh, and McDowell. Of those three, the most densely populated county was McDowell, where African Americans constituted one quarter of the population in both the 1930 and 1940 census. Black miners constituted the second largest ethnic group of miners after those identified as native whites, more than any other single group of Eastern or Southern European immigrants who began arriving in the coal fields in the 1880s. African Americans were mining coal by the 1870s. There was a major influx of European immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe to the country, but especially to the coal fields of the state. As we look at this photograph, and again, I'm going to, nope, I'm not going to do that. Sorry, technical glitch. I promise those. There's one. I'm going to zoom in. And again, let's take a look at this part of the photograph. The State Department of Mines annual report for 1933 documented that more than 5,500 Blacks worked in the mines of McDowell County, more than 3,400 in Raleigh County, and more than 2,400 in Logan County. Now that the men you see here are second shift miners at the Price Hill Colliery Company mine located just south of Mount Hope in Northern Raleigh County. Let me just go back there just to give you a sense of, hang on here, get out of this, go back here. We're talking right about here where the H in Raleigh County is. That's about where this mine is located. This is part of a larger photograph in which a total of 13 <coughs> African-American miners are standing in the back row. Here, there are only six, six out of those 13. 
Now in the Northern Coldfield, Marion County, the middle of the three Northern Coldfield counties where a number of African-Americans lived, uh, employed more than 1,100 African-Americans. Now, like virtually all miners, black or white, European ancestry, native white, which is to say the mountaineer, the white mountaineers whose families had come into the state in the 1800s, 1700s. These miners and their families lived in company housing, company towns adjacent to the mines where they worked. As there were hundreds of mines in the southern coal fields and dozens and dozens of mines in the northern field, there were a multitude of black small black communities embedded within those company towns. And they were scattered throughout the coal fields because the mines themselves were similarly scattered. Typical of migrating people everywhere, black mountaineers imported and cultivated their own music from the beginning. Work songs by the tract laying gangs who first built and then continued to maintain the railroads after construction were a common feature. The blues from the Piedmont of Virginia and the Carolinas. This is not the Mississippi blues that are very well known. The Piedmont blues, less well known, but a regional variety of the blues from east of the Appalachians. Dance music played by fiddles and banjos. String band music, in other words, arrived from further south. <clears throat> Seth was discussing string band music making uh, at the Augusta Heritage Center. We're talking the same tradition as carried out by African-American players. In the world of sacred music, spirituals in the 19th century that would be replaced in the 20th century by gospel music sung by quartets of men and women were to be heard in black Protestant churches in West Virginia. Beginning in the 1890s, something new happens. Traveling tent shows and circuses presented a variety of entertainment to black mountaineers in the coal fields. Comedians, singers, dancers, etc., made their way into the state to entertain black audiences, introducing, in many cases, the products of songwriters and lyricists <clears throat> located in New York's center of popular music, Tin Pan Alley. In other words, a music that did not originate in the uh, ancestral homelands of black mountaineers but rather um, was imported from New York. Another form, other forms of music making were community bands and later dance bands. This is a photo of the, West, uh, of the Piedmont West Virginia City Band taken in 1910. Now Piedmont is located in the northern part of the state. I'll show you a map shortly that gives its location. I want to direct your attention to the small trumpet player right here, fourth from the left. His name is Don Redman, and he would go on to be one of the first arrangers of jazz for big bands in the country when he was a member of Fletcher Henderson's orchestra in New York City. His arrangements accommodated the most extraordinary trumpet soloist that Fletcher Henderson ever employed, and one of the most extraordinary jazz trumpeters of all time, Louis Armstrong. I would also direct your attention, just as an aside, to this young man here, who was apparently a member of the band, but apparently didn't get the memo that she should bring his instrument. So instead, he brought a fishing net, but he was young, and so we have to expect that sort of thing. I mentioned dance bands. Cal Greer and his Whispering Serenaders was a band based in Huntington, West Virginia. And again, I'll show you on a map where Huntington is. But his work took him not only from, to, from Huntington elsewhere, but especially to Charleston, the state capital. And in between is located the campus of West Virginia State College, uh, one of the leading black colleges of the nation in the 1930s, one of three black colleges in the state. Uh, so he was very active in that area of the state. Now, if we think about each of these types of music as a layer, from the oldest at the bottom, we have the work songs, the spirituals, the string band music, overlaid later by gospel music, and then 
music of Tin Pan Alley. The youngest layer will be, the top layer will be, the music of the big dance bands uh, from the late 20s through the 1930s and into the 40s. So this raises a question and I go back to my disbelief at what Herb Hall said about all the bands going to West Virginia. The question is, how did black mountaineers come to have the resources to go to public dances for which these big bands from New York, Chicago, uh, Detroit and other Northern cities came to perform for them? How did they become familiar that the, with the music the bands were playing? Let's begin with the first question. How do they come to have the resources? Now, obviously the fact that the coal fields were rich in this mineral and the work of mining it until the end of the 1930s was very labor intensive accounts for the large workforce in the coal mining industry. African Americans after emancipation were looking for employment, as I said, and mining and railroad construction were industries that needed their labor. Because the men were paid regularly in cash, the incentive to come to West Virginia for this work was extremely high. Over the balance of the 1800s after 1870 or so, uh, up to 1930, there was a steady stream of African Americans migrating into West Virginia to find work and in general, a better life than they'd experienced in the South. The third bullet may surprise you. Article four, section one of the state's constitution of 1872 stated that the male citizens of the state shall be entitled to vote at all elections within the counties in which they respectively reside. Note, it did not say the white male residents. It did not say male residents who own property. It did not say male residents whose grandfathers had voted. It simply stated all male residents. African-Americans in the mountain state had the right to vote African-American men. It would take us of course to 1920 to include the women. And in several of the counties in the Southern coal fields, especially in McDowell County, their votes could be decisive in an election because the white population was roughly evenly split between Republicans and Democrats. The way the black vote went typically determined the outcome of an election in terms of which party uh, dom predominated. But I think there was another uh, implication to this right to vote. It tended to insulate them from interference in their public social lives by white politicians and police whose counterparts further south, as we know, could often be counted upon to harass, intimidate, and even terrorize local black populations on the slightest pretext and without fear of retribution. Now to the fourth bullet. What was the bituminous coal code, the fourth precondition? And what does it have to do with big bands coming to the mountain state? The bituminous coal code was one of numerous initiatives associated with the first 100 days of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's first term as president. It was one component of a piece of legislation termed the National Industrial Recovery Act, a part of the New Deal that the Roosevelt administration hoped would jumpstart the economy and bring the Great Depression to a close. Focusing on the bituminous coal industry and with its general agreement, the bituminous coal code established two basic principles. First, it asked the mine owners to come to consensus on the price per ton of all grades of coal they produced with the understanding that the government would not proceed to accuse them of price fixing by implementing such a pricing schedule. In exchange for this level of pricing, the mine owners had to agree to allow the United Mine Workers of America to organize the labor in all mines operated by owners who signed on to this code. Significant is the fact that unlike many labor unions in this nation, 
the UMW of A did not discriminate against black miners. Contracts negotiated with these coal companies guaranteed equal work for equal pay for both black and white members of the union. As a result, all miners saw their incomes rise to the point where it could be fairly said that black miners in the mountain state enjoyed what I would call comparative prosperity, comparative to the economic conditions of African-Americans living in the South, and as well as those who had migrated to Northern cities as part of the great migration. That comparative prosperity meant that they had discretionary income, which as events would prove they spent going to dances for which bands came from New York, Chicago, Detroit, Kansas City, and elsewhere with great regularity. Now, when conducting my study of Herb Hall's contention that all the bands were going to West Virginia because the mines were working and everyone was employed, the most consistent evidence of this musical culture was to be found in the newspaper record of the period. If I had to say which of my primary sources was the most primary, the first among equals, it would be newspapers, particularly one of the leading black newspapers of the country, the Pittsburgh Courier. For many black West Virginians, the Pittsburgh Courier was, as one informant told me, quote, more or less the paper, the paper for people of color, and was arguably one of the two most politically and culturally influential newspapers in African America during the 1930s, the other being the Chicago Defender. The Courier regularly published engagements by national bands in major cities and on tours, and gave particular attention to those bands' future performances in Western Pennsylvania, where Pittsburgh's located, but also in West Virginia. It also printed reports from black communities scattered all over, thereby documenting engagements by traveling bands in both the Northern and Southern parts of the state. Newspapers from the Coldfield County's communities themselves also provided essential information, both in the form of advertisements and in reporting. Local coverage might document such incidents as the failure of a band to materialize, something that might happen for various reasons, bad weather, an accident, mechanical difficulties involving the band's bus, as well as gave estimates of the size of crowds attending a dance. But another component of this development is the work of the bands themselves to build reputations and thus attract audiences, whether in West Virginia or elsewhere. A scholar colleague of mine named Jeffrey McGee identified the three elements that dance bands, particularly black dance bands, had to engage with to be a success in the 1930s. The three R's. Radio went hand in hand with newspapers in keeping black West Virginians and others in African America in touch with a larger musical culture. In the 1930s, radio programming included live broadcasts by major dance bands originating in one or another venue in the nation's major cities. Again, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Chicago, Kansas City, and on to the West Coast. The radio networks enable stations in or near West Virginia to <clears throat> transmit these performances. Such programs featured a band's latest hits and gave exposure to its leading soloists. Between newspaper reports and broadcast performances, black bands were able to build a fan base upon which to capitalize during subsequent tours. But that raised a question for me and it might have be occurring to you. In a rural state like West Virginia in the 1930s, how many black mountaineers were in a position to hear such broadcasts since some form of electricity was essential to powering radios. I ask you to consider the following map. This map dates from 1927. And again, I'm going to zoom in to check out some details specifically right here. Notice the nature of the grid at this point in this part of the state very dense series of lines. This dash line means a um, transmission line is under construction or being contemplated. These represent uh, community-based electrical systems as well. So what are all these others? 
Well, they're sources of electricity generated by the mines themselves. <clears throat> because mines required electricity, power was also used to light the homes in the adjacent company towns. Now, this is the most extensive part of the grid, the most complex. We go to where the northern coal fields are, you see it's more dispersed. But you'll notice there are many parts of the state for which electricity did not exist in the late 20s. Uh, this has interesting uh, implications for the musical culture of West Virginia. Here we have access through radio to the larger uh, musical world. Here, comparative isolation. Now, if you focus again on this part, look at this map. You can see the overlay of the coalfield counties on the electrical grid. The mines, the mining communities, the mining towns, the coal company towns of the southern coal fields had radios. Indeed, as early as 1925, 70% of coal company housing was electrified, even if there were a few other amenities. And it would seem reasonable to assume that that percentage would grow in the years to come. One informant who as a child lived near Williamson, which is down here in the southern part of the southwestern part of the state, <clears throat> on the border with Kentucky, told me that although her family's home, coal company town home, had only outdoor plumbing and a cold water tap on the back porch, it had electricity and the family owned a radio. So let's look again. For many, the radio station of choice, and we're still focusing on radio, was WLW from Cincinnati, Ohio. A 50,000 watt station, powerful transmitter, the most powerful transmitters in radio at the time were 50,000 watts strong. A clear channel station at 700 on the AM dial, clear channel means no other radio station occupies that frequency. And it was heard in West Virginia. In fact, among <clears throat> my viewers, any of you in West Virginia uh, might just amuse yourselves after I'm done by going to an AM radio and turning to 700 and see what you get. I was able to pick up um, WLW here in Morgantown in the northern part of the state several years ago. Cincinnati Reds baseball game was being broadcast at the time. Now, in Logan, McDowell, and Mingo counties, the south, uh, southernmost counties of the state in the southern coal fields, this may have been the only, um, the, the only station they could pick up. But <clears throat> elsewhere, the Columbia Broadcasting System included in its network five of the nine stations operating in West Virginia in the 1930s in Wheeling, Fairmont, Charleston, Huntington, and Parkersburg. Parkersburg is out of range of us, but the others are all adjacent to coal mining. That Black Mount West Virginians were in fact listening to big band music. That's another question. Okay, you have electricity, you have a radio. You're listening to this stuff? Yes. And the evidence for that is documented in the Pittsburgh Courier. A report of a dance held at a social club in Fairmont on September the 12th, 1932, concluded with the following, quote, well-wishers of Benny Moten's Kansas City Orchestra may tune in to WLW on Saturday and Sunday evenings at 10 o'clock, unquote. In, 19, in February of 32, a letter to the Pittsburgh Courier um, from a West Virginian whose name was Mr. Red, who identified himself as a regular radio maniac, how many of those do we know? was always happy to hear the bands led by Father Hines, Don Redman, Cab Calloway, and Noble Sissel, but, and I quote, if you want to give me an idea of paradise, kindly let me have an occasional idea of the whereabouts of the incomparable Duke Ellington, the renowned Fletcher Henderson, and the one and only McKinney's Cotton Pickers. These three constitute the radio world's idea of heaven, unquote. Why he's asking about the whereabouts of these bands is because in terms of radio programming, black bands were far less likely to get airtime than white bands. So you had to 
figure out when they were on the air so that you could listen to them. Now, the second R is, is recordings, obviously. And I have to say that recordings ran a distant second to radio when it came to building an audience for a particular band. Folks in the cold fields did own Victrolas. I asked about that, and yes, they did. Wind-up Victrolas are ones that ran on electricity. But the discs themselves were harder to come by. Coal company stores uh, did sell records, but the recollections of those I interviewed for this project indicated that what they tended to stock was popular music for a white audience, which was not surprisingly uh, country music. You could buy records in the larger towns in the county seats like Welsh or MacDowell County or Beckley and Raleigh County, and certainly in Charleston, but you had to travel there to do it. And mail order was a third possibility. But compared to the easy access to big bands performances on the radio, records in the coal fields were not as influential on people's taste in dance music. So now we come to the third R, the road really roads that brought touring bands to the mountain state. There are several parts to this topic. So um, I will take them in turn and <clears throat> we'll see how it holds together. I hope reasonably well. From 1934 to 1943, the period in which big band jazz and dance music became a major cultural presence for black mountaineers began with several developments in 1934 that mark its beginning, because by 1934, the bituminous coal codes reforms <clears throat> were clearly reflected in the options that black mountaineers had in terms of entertainment. To begin, for the first time, a New York-based dance band led by Noble Sissel played three engagements within as many days in the mountain state, beginning in Wheeling on March the 20th in the northern part of the state, then jumping all the way down to Welch in the southern part of the state, and then to Charleston uh, for the third engagement. These occurred respectively on March 20, 21, and 22 of 1934. Sissel had played the previous February for a white audience, and yes, dances were racially segregated with a couple of uh, exceptions. But interesting to note that the venue in which he performed for that white audience had a balcony where black mountaineers were accommodated. Now, why was this? Well, as it turns out, Sissel's band had played for a black audience in Wheeling the previous October. And according to the Pittsburgh Courier, <clears throat> 500 whites had stormed the balcony and raved over the music. In the period from 1929 to 1934, and that is just before the uh, onset of the flowering of big band jazz and dance music in the state, bands that played in the state usually played only one engagement before moving elsewhere. And this was clearly due to the extreme poverty the crash imposed on their potential audience. Sissel's experience with three consecutive engagements in as many days is suggestive of changing times. A second sign of the New Times was a remarkable engagement in September 1934 that in many respects seems to suggest that big band jazz and dance music was rapidly becoming the major focus of black audiences in West Virginia. It took place in the northern coal field community of Fairmont, the county seat of Marion County, the center of those three counties uh, that I showed you. Two articles in the Fairmont Times informed readers of the pending arrival of what would turn out to be the band that would ultimately play the most engagements of any jazz black dance band between 1934 and 1942. September 11th, the original Jimmy Lunsford and his New York Cotton Club Orchestra will play for local colored dancers next Tuesday. Jimmy Lunsford's Harlem Express, as he named his band, had made its reputation in New York's Cotton Club, a club located in Harlem, as many of you are surely aware. Many of you will indeed immediately associate the Cotton Club with Duke Ellington, and rightly so, because it was there beginning in 1927 
that he assembled an extraordinary band and created an enduring reputation, not only as band leader, but also as a composer for his band. Ellington moved on and Cab Calloway moved in. And then when he departed, the Lunsford band took the stand. Now the Cotton Club had what was called at the time a radio wire, meaning that it was equipped to broadcast its, band, its performances over the radio, which is to say that many black mountaineers would know of Lunsford music before he came. Now, I also want to direct your attention here just briefly to the following. You will see that by the time this article is on the published the afternoon of the dance, already word had been received of people who were um, going to come. And they came from seven towns at least, Cumberland, Frostburg, Piedmont, Weston, Elkins, Morgantown, Clarksburg, and Uniontown. Now, let's see where those are. Focusing in on Northern West Virginia here, here's Fairmont, the site of the dance. Cumberland, Piedmont, yes, the home of Don Redmond and the Piedmont City Band that you saw. Piedmont, incidentally, is the home of uh, the birthplace of another leading African-American uh, public figure today. Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr. is a native of Piedmont, West Virginia. Um, other towns include Cumberland uh, here, Frostburg, which is due north of Piedmont, sort of where the M in Cumberland is located. Um, just a sec here, I want to turn the page, make sure I don't forget anything. Reference was made to the town of Weston, which is down here, south and west of Clarksburg, which was referenced in Morgantown, of course. Uniontown is approximately where the S in Pennsylvania is located. And incidentally, for those who are uncertain, Pittsburgh is located about here, where the Courier is published. Now, the distance to be traveled to the, for the, to the Lunsford Band's dance was considerable for folks who lived over here in Piedmont and in Frostburg and in Cumberland. And because these towns are high in the Allegheny Mountains. The highways, yes, there were highways, but they had steep grades down into various river valleys, sharp turns as well. This is not even today driving US Route 50, if that means anything to any of you, and it may well, Driving from this part of the state to Fairmont was really a challenge, especially in this part of the state where the mountains are high, the valleys are steep and deep. Now, like all dance bands of the period, the Lunsford band was sharply dressed and unlike some was musically highly disciplined. When Lunsford counted off the band's theme song on September the 18th, 1934, at the National Guard Armory in Fairmont. The crowd, which would be estimated at around 700 people, knew that it was in the presence of an outstanding band. And suddenly the music that was been coming out of their speakers was now right in front of them. <laughs> Thank you. 
as you could tell, the arrangement of Jazznocracy, the band's theme song at the time, was intended to introduce not only the band as a whole, but also several of its soloists, specifically trombonist Russell Bowles, tenor saxophonist Joe Thomas, and on muted trumpet, Cy Oliver, who had become one of big band jazz's principal arrangers in the course of the rest of the 30s and into the 40s and even 50s. So in addition to Noble Sissel's band and Jimmy Lunsford's band, and to quote Herbert Hall once more, what were all the bands that were going to West Virginia? We'll begin with a simple statistic. The newspaper record that I studied documented that a total of 24 black dance bands played for 144 dances in West Virginia in that period, beginning in 1934, the vast majority thereafter. Most dances took place in National Guard armories as had this dance in September of 1934. Other than that, venues included the gymnasiums of black high schools and one club in Huntington, West Virginia, which could be rented by private parties called the Vanity Fair. Now, I'm not going to be able to list all 24 bands, and you may be grateful for that. But here's the list of the top 10 in terms of number of engagements, each of which played in the Mountain State. Sorry. Here we go. Jimmy Lunsford, 19, between 1934 and 42. Joe King Oliver, 15, in a fairly limited period. Some of these bands may or may not be known to you at this point, but notice Don Redman came seven times. Uh, this is the same Don Redman who you saw in the city band of Piedmont. Chick Webb and Ella Fitzgerald. Chick Webb died tragically young. Ella Fitzgerald continued to front his band uh, for a number of years. Earl Father Hines from Chicago. Nobles, uh, Walter Barnes was also from Chicago. And here are some more um, <clears throat> names you may know better in some cases. Count Basie, Cab Calloway, Duke Ellington. Now, we have one more piece of evidence to put into the mix and then I will conclude. So finally, Apart from the fact that so many bands did come to the Mountain State, is there any substantial evidence to support Hall's contention that they did so because, again, to quote him once more, the mines were operating and everyone was employed? And the answer is yes. Evidence that supports the accuracy of his recollection comes in a rare source, a professional musician's diary, or as they say in the world of jazz and other musics, a gig book. This one was kept by a clarinetist from New Orleans named Paul Barnes. And he was a member of a band <clears throat> led by Joe King Oliver, best known as the mentor to Louis Armstrong in the late teens and early 20s of the last century. <clears throat> Barnes was a member of his band from October 34 to February 35 when they were based in Huntington. They had migrated up from New Orleans and decided they would put down roots in Huntington for a while, perhaps because they were getting word of the uh, comparative prosperity of their potential audience. In his gig book, Barnes entered the name of the town in which each engagement occurred, the race of the audience, sometimes the venue where the dance took place, and most importantly, what each musician earned for that engagement because the King Oliver Band followed a principle that the musicians got paid at the end of the night, night after night. So let's take a look at a page. It begins, this particular page, page 68, begins on Christmas Day, 1934. They left Huntington and they played an engagement in Ashland, Kentucky for a colored, his term, audience each person earned $5. They returned to Huntington. The next day, they play in Welch, West Virginia, for a white dance of World War I veterans. Reside overnight. That's interesting because Welch had a black hotel <clears throat> owned and operated by one of the leading political figures of McDowell County and the state, a man named Capehart. 
On the 27th, they play in Williamson for $4. This is a colored dance, C-O-L. And here's one of the misfortunes that the band seemed to encounter. The front wheel uh, of the, ba the, the left front wheel of the bus was coming off. Uh, Eldridge, remember the band, <clears throat> saw it in time to prevent an accident. They hired a truck and a taxi and took uh, everybody to Williamson for the engagement. The next day, they hired a, uh, another taxi to take them up uh, down the um, Tug Fork River to Kermit, West Virginia, and I'll show you these in a map briefly, where they played for a dance, earning 471 tips included. Now, just to review, Huntington, let's bring this in, Huntington to Ashland, which is up here, then they played in Welch, Williamson, Kermit is about here, and back to Huntington. Now, what do all of Barnes's entries reveal taken together? Here is a summary of the data from his book, comparing the income earned in West Virginia with that earned in seven other states. You will see dramatic difference. 21 dances in West Virginia earned them $61.75 per musician. 29 dances in seven other states earned them $32.82. Now, a purchasing power, multiply these figures by 19, I am told by Google, um, to get something approximating purchasing power. Once again, 61.75 for 21 dances in West Virginia per musician, 32.82 for 29 dances in seven other states. In other words, it speaks for itself. All the bands were going to West Virginia because the mines were operating and everyone was employed and they earned almost twice as much in West Virginia as they did in other states. Now, sadly, it came to an end. The culture of big band jazz and dance music came to an end for two interrelated reasons. One, the increasing mechanization of mining that took place beginning in the late 30s. What this meant was that <clears throat> the labor intensity of the past was beginning to decline. Miners were put out of work. Given our traditions of labor history, it won't surprise you to know that the first to be let go in many instances were African-American miners. And that began a gradual out-migration from the state. That's telling me I have my 50 minutes. Give me two minutes more, I'll be done. But beyond that, World War II, the onset of World War II, which led to the following. Policies adopted in June of 1942 curtailed the use of petroleum and rubber. You saw Don Albert's bus at the beginning of my presentation like all buses and all vehicles, it used rubber tires. They wore out, now they couldn't be replaced. As far as petroleum, rationing limited the use of any vehicle to four gallons a week. As we can see in this article, caught short before the law took effect, Count Basie, leader of American's number one band, almost didn't leave town to fill a session at the Howard Theater in Washington. Bands broke up. Bands had no place to go except to find work in their hometowns. And in a number of instances, there was no work available. In any event, the bands who came to West Virginia with very few exceptions came by bus and that was no longer a possibility. And thus the era wound down. Sad to say. Thank you very much. Now is the time for questions, which Emily and Seth are going to oversee. Yes. Wow. First off, thank you so much, Dr. Wilkinson. That was really wonderful. Um, I think if you 
if you stop sharing, we'll put it in gallery view so we can see everybody. And um, I think we can let people um, actually unmute and ask some questions. So uh, if you click on gallery view, you can see all the pretty faces um, if you want to. Um, and so I think I have allowed folks to um, unmute themselves to ask questions. Um, so we can do that. But let me first start with some of the ones that came in via the chat. So um, wonderful to see all your faces, everybody. Um, we have um, maybe maybe keep yourself muted for now. Um, I'm going to mute somebody. Oh, Centurion, sorry. There's a little bit of background noise. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So there were a couple of questions. Karen asked, which I believe you addressed, but just to um, address again, were the audiences always segregated? I think you said there were a few exceptions. The, the yes, the the audiences were were segregated. There were ostensibly black band black dances, and white dances, even though the the band may have been African American in both instances. But there were these, there was in some instances porous, as for example, that engagement in Wheeling, where the balcony could be filled with members of one race, while the dance was ostensibly being given for members of the other race. There was also a one instance, but these are really exceptional in the town of Montgomery, West Virginia, in which uh, a dance was held and a curtain was placed down the middle of the, the dance floor. Wow. With, in theory, black folk on one side and white folk on other, but I have speculated idly about how long that, band, that curtain stayed up. Uh, and so, but yes, in the vast majority of in instances, the dances were segregated. Um, we had another question um, from Cindy. Did did these bands, did you find in your research, did these bands inspire any local development of local swing and jazz musicians? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Um, there were there were local uh, d um, bands, not so much noted for their jazz style, but individuals in the bands uh, hmm. did uh, cultivate jazz style. There was one band, I have to say, that came from the town of Bluefield in extreme south uh, eastern um, West Virginia that would make its way to Cincinnati and become a, a, a band of some regional popularity. Um, but uh, for the most part, the jazz seemed to come, at least in terms of ba big bands, from the, uh, the visitors. Uh, right. Local musicians play jazz. I do not want to suggest otherwise. But my experience is, and the evidence suggests, that the bands themselves played a, a sweeter music. Um, it should be noted that uh, I mentioned the CBS radio network uh, transmitted in, in, in West Virginia. CBS radio network broadcast six or seven nights a week, either a 15 or 30 minute program from the Roosevelt Hotel in New York City, the house band of which was Guy Lombardo and his Royal Canadians. Uh, I can see faces here of people who remember Guy Lombardo uh, whether they choose to or not is something else, but his was a very, very sweet band, no jazz allowed. Uh, and he was quite specific in his biography, autobiography about his intentions for the kind of music he wanted his band to play. Dr. Wilkinson, I'm wondering, you know, if in your research, have you found a lasting musical impact that is a through line in, in West Virginia from this area, era? Um, I haven't gone looking for one, but I would be very surprised because this music is a music of a certain generation. Uh, and that's not, I'm not in any way denigrating it or any music, but every generation has its own musical style. And by the time you get past World War II and into the 1950s, big band music is being replaced, especially in, well, in African America by rhythm and blues, which of course is the forerunner of rock and roll and we move into the 60s, where many of us were coming of age. And of course, Motown's uh, style out of Detroit represents a totally different style. So the notion of big band jazz in general, not just in West Virginia, uh, it is really attenuated now. And 
avid record collectors and people like me who love it uh, represent its continuation. In universities, and I can say West Virginia University for one, there will be jazz bands as part of a jazz program. And they will be playing charts, that is arrangements of music from this period, without doubt. But again, that's not out in the public. They're not giving dances, you know, they're not touring the state and playing for public dances. People don't publicly dance that way uh, anymore. Except for the Augusta Heritage Center. Well, yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> I do, you know, uh, when you mention like armories and things like that, um, you know, when I was a teen, a big thing to do, of course, it was DJs. It wasn't yeah. uh, a dance, but I, I wonder if the format had changed, but the vibe had been the same because there were always dances at the, at the armory. Yeah, well, you can be certain that the big bands uh, were very, very systematic about how they went about um uh, programming music for a dance. Uh, one of the best uh, examples of this is actually provided by Duke Ellington, thanks to a couple of enterprising fans in, of all places, Fargo, North Dakota, who recorded his band at a local ballroom in 1940. The first 30 minutes of his program, he systematically went through a variety of musical styles using not only his own compositions, but selected compositions by others. Just in a sense, take the uh, temperature of the audience in terms of style. And this is true with the, the, the black dance bands. Jimmy Lunsford would program a set of four numbers and each of them would have a, you know, be somewhat different in temperature from cooler sweet music to hot jazz, such as jazznocracy, uh, to appeal to different cohorts within the, the dancing audience that was present. Wow, I guess we all need to take a note there. I, I just thought it was read the audience and see if they wanted one up tempo or yeah. Uh, maybe we should yeah. be all be employing the number system. I like yeah. it. I yeah. like it. There's, there's three more <laughs> questions from the chat here. Um, one is from Ellen. Uh, sort of more personal question. What was the most fun of fun part for you of compiling this information and this? Okay. Uh, let me give a shout out to my cousin, Ellen Webb, who lives in Florida now, who's an alumna of West Virginia University and who lived in Bridgeport for many years, moving there from Cambridge Springs, Pennsylvania. Enough of the family history. <laughs> you know what was the most fun? Uh, it was not reading endless reels micro, of microfilm, watch, reading newspapers. It was talking to folks. And I had the privilege of talking about 12 or 13 African-American uh, <clears throat> mountaineers uh, many from the Southern Coldfield counties, uh, which gave me the opportunity to get to know that part of the state, um, about their, their memories. Now, they, of course, in many cases, came of age at the end of the 1930s, but they had family stories and they had clear memories uh, of the past. This is one of the advantages of interviewing us elderly folk, because we have very good long-term memories. I might not be able to tell you what I ate two days ago, but I'm very clear about what happens in the late 50s and early 60s, should anybody care to ask. <laughs> um, and so I would say that uh, that was wonderful because they discussed aspects of life having little to do with music itself, but giving me a perspective on African, the African-American experience of Black West Virginians in the period um, of the 30s and, and 40s. So that was fun. Yeah. And that was very informative. Um, uh, ben DeVault Irwin, hi Ben, uh, asks, um, it's sort of a question, you sort of already answered this, mentioning that band from Bluefield, but um, you said you mentioned several national acts that toured in West Virginia. Were there any bands from West Virginia that were popular? And it sounds like... Yeah, th th this one band, okay. um, Phil Edwards Collegians was the name, uh, from Bluefield. Call, so called because a number of its founding members were students at Bluefield State College. I mentioned West Virginia State College. Bluefield State College was another of the three state schools for African Americans. Um, and um, the third, by the way, was Storer College in Harper's Ferry. And Don Redmond majored in music at Storer College before he went off to his career. But um, that was about it. And Phil Edwards. Uh, band uh, moved from uh, Cincinnati ultimately to Philadelphia. And unfortunately there, the competition was just too, too intense. The local musicians are not about to welcome with open arms a visiting band that could steal their work. Uh, and that's not just true of Philadelphia. 
that kind of brotherly love is to be found all sorts of places. But um, um, the band unfortunately f fell apart uh, in Philadelphia, broke up in Philadelphia. Um, there was a, just speaking of Don Redmond, there was a comment on the Facebook page from Seth Keibel, wonderful um, swing and jazz musician. Uh, he said, he was very excited when you mentioned Don Redman. He said, great uncle of Joshua Redman, who I, I don't know Joshua's work. Oh, but... Joshua Redman is a tenor saxophonist um, who came into my uh, awareness in the course of the 1980s. Um, so um, I haven't followed his career and that says nothing about him. It says everything about me. Um, so, but yes. Yeah, great. Uh, Joshua. Joshua yeah. Redman is the son of Dewey Redman, a tenor saxophonist who uh, performed in San Francisco, actually rehearsed in my apartment uh, when I was just getting started uh, cool. back in the 1960s. So he is Joshua Redman's father, Dewey Redman. Noted. Potentially, so I guess Don Redman might be Joshua Redman's uncle. Possibly. Possibly. Yeah, um, Dewey, Dewey, Redmond's, Dewey Redmond's uncle, Joshua's great uncle. Yeah, okay, I didn't yeah. know. That would right. make yeah, sense. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. Dewey's uncle. Yeah. 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 Cool. Interesting. Um, one of our other, oh, sorry, one of our other um, participants, Flon Williams from DC, said, he, he, Flon has done a lot of sound engineering work, and he said, I worked with Guy Lombardo and his Royal Canadians in January 1977 for one of Jimmy Carter's inaugural parties. Mm-hmm. Um, also on the bill, the Charlie Daniels Band and James Talley. Kind of, uh -huh. of... engineers get around. Um, th there's um, Hannah Fuller asks, did the black community influence the dance styles happening at the dances? This is interesting. Thank you for bringing up the subject of black dance. Um, because I was curious, just as I was curious about, okay, how did black mountaineers learn about big band dance music out of New York? Obviously, the radio, we made that clear. But what about dance? Uh, you can't see a dance. You can't see the Lindy Hop in a radio. I've tried, heaven knows, but it doesn't work. So I was curious to know how did the Lindy Hop, which is what you would have done to jazznocracy, and I can imagine the minute uh, he counted off that number and the first eight bars were heard, there were people up on their feet out on the dance floor to dance to that very fast tempo uh, piece. And what I learned was two things. First of all, it was very easy to get from the Southern coal fields to New York City by train. It only took eight or nine hours and passenger trains ran frequently. But also people who traveled up to New York and went to one or another sites where the modern jazz dancing of the time was done would bring it back with them and teach it to their um, uh, friends. One of the most powerful voices for for music in the black community of Charleston was a music educator by the name of Maud Wanzer Lanes. And she taught her music curriculum included the teaching of arranging for jazz band. But she also went to New York and she came back and she taught her students how to do the Lindy. So I don't believe, I, I think what we find here is that the dance, dances associated with um, big band jazz were imported to West Virginia, as was the music. Uh, it was not a case of the, the, the local dance styles, the historic dance styles of black mountaineers and white mountaineers for that matter, um, inflected the style of dancing that came from New York. I think they represented two different approaches, traditions, practices. Hmm. Um. One of just, there's a couple more comments that have come in here. One from uh, my colleague and wonderful dancer herself and assistant, uh, or a, um, sorry, professor of dance here at d and &E, Lori Go. Um, she was saying that um, she's noticed that some of the popular music that the youth is listening to samples some of the big band music, which, yeah, so it's coming, sort of comes around. Oh, yeah. Oh, at, yeah new styles which is great and Lori and and dr wilkinson if you have not met each other yet you definitely should um Lori is my uh chris and i have been talking about uh the appalachian ensemble summit and Lori mm -hmm. is the dance mm -hmm. director 
nature of that. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, well, you know, <clears throat> one can explain that by an observation that Duke Ellington made uh, to a, a radio station in Stockholm, Sweden, uh, when he said, if it sounds good, it's going to be good. And if it's going to be good, you can imagine people who have big ears to listen to all styles of music are going to gravitate to that and bring it into their own contemporary musical expression. It's good to know. Right. Um, okay, Bob Webb says, um, the recording you played sounded really good. Is there a list of other recordings in this period? Oh, there can be a list. Uh, again, uh, this, this, this webness, uh, the, the web has been extended. Uh, Bob Webb is the older brother of Ellen Webb. He lives in Richmond, another first cousin. I'm so shameless. <laughs> Oh, um, yes, Bob, there, I can get you or anybody a list of, of recordings from this period. Um, and I reference a number of, of pieces in uh, the book I wrote about this as well. So. I was just going to say, I recommend getting uh, the book, Big Band Jazz in Black West Virginia, uh, has a lot of really, you know, along these lines of what we learned yeah. tonight. And you can dig in at your own pace. Um, it's really really good read. Dr. Wilkinson, we have uh, one question that just came in from the Facebook feed. Okay. Um, Red asks, were tent show bands a training ground for future jazz musicians? I have to utter the, those three little words that men find so hard to say at a time like this. I don't know. <laughs> however, however, I would assume that musicians were going to play uh, where there's an opportunity to do so. And the 10 shows were playing ragtime. Of that, I am certain, at the beginning of the last century, because that's when ragtime was at its height. And ragtime was one of the two most influential musical practices on the formation of jazz style. So there's every reason to believe that they could have. But I'm not in a position to cite uh, individuals uh, or a band that sort of morphed from being a circus band or a uh, vaudeville potential band into being a jazz band. Interesting. Well, I, I think unless anyone has a, another last minute question, if you're on the Zoom, you can just unmute yourself and ask. Otherwise, um, I will just say another huge thank you to Dr. Wilkinson. Um, it has been such a pleasure. I'd like oh. to uh, oh, yeah, there's a question from Tom. Well, it's not so much a question, but I was uh, known as Centurion through this uh, entire uh, arrangement, and uh, I finally had the technical um, hit the right button to change to my actual identity. I just want to <laughs> say hello to Carol. I'm sure you don't remember me, but I remember you because we met oh so many years ago, and uh, you have gotten absolutely beautiful. This is a lucky <laughs> man. I mean, Dr. Uh, All right. Okay. Uh, uh, excuse me. A little background here, folks. Uh, Tom and I went to the same college and were members of the same fraternity. So you have to make I allowances. Love it. You have to make allowances. You have to forgive us. Yeah. I mean me. Uh, you know. And Carol is Dr. Wilkinson's wife. So yeah. we have uh, all these. All these yeah, it's, it's very incestuous here. But uh, I have to say that uh, I was waiting and waiting and uh, to hear music. Uh, as you can see, I'm an amateur, but not very good. Um, I play guitar and things. But uh, then it, at the critical moment, the music burst through. So I thought that was a very dramatic uh, part of the presentation. And I Thank was you. very impressed. I'm also impressed that you now have a, a very large white beard. Yeah, that happens. More yeah. as, as professorial as the background uh, of your of your den. Study. Yeah. Uh, so yes, very professorial indeed. Sorry for the interjection of all this. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I enjoyed this very much, and I, I want to uh, thank Augusta Heritage Center and Emily and uh, Seth. This chap Seth. with a nice black beard. What's your first yeah. name? I mean, yeah, professorial in the making. Um, yeah. Thank you very much as well. I didn't rename myself either. I just yeah. yeah. So this has been great for me, and I'm I'm very glad that uh, Dr. Wilkinson. Uh, offered me the invitation to join this group. Mm -hmm. I, had, I had a great time. Thanks great. So Thank you. Yes. yes. One one last question um, from Lori Go. She says, um, my mentor, Catherine Dunham, 
and her film and her dance company were the dancers in the film Stormy Weather and choreographed Scott Joplin's music. Um, how influential were films like these in West Virginia music and dance? Um, that's a good question. That that's an excellent question, and I should have said I should have drawn attention to the fact that dance, modern jazz dance coming out of the black community of America could be seen on newsreels uh, and could be seen in certain films. Um, in fact, if everybody, anybody wants to see <laughs> perfection in doing the Lindy Hop, go to YouTube and enter the following term, Hell's a Poppin, H-E-L-L-Z-A-P-O-P-P-I-N. And you will see Whitey's Lindy Hoppers a dance group based in Harlem. Whitey was not white, but, um, and they do extraordinary stuff. And the only caveat would be after you watch this, do not attempt to do this at home. <laughs> you can hurt yourself. Bet. <laughs> but that's all I know, uh, Professor Go. I don't know anything more. And I didn't track a black film exhibition, which I think would be uh, slim to none, to be perfectly honest, in, in West Virginia at the time, given the nature of the enterprise of this movie theaters. Yeah. Well, thank you again so much. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to contribute one oh, final yes, comment. Of course. Uh, I have the privilege of working with Dr. Wilkinson on a three-part television project um, for uh, educational television for PBS that will be uh, this exact same subject matter that we hope will be broadcast on PBS affiliates. And I'm just very excited to have heard uh, this version of it. He's a wonderful uh, partner in terms of um, uh, exploring and explaining and teaching about all of this. And we're working in partnership with developing this for television. Really thank cool. You. That will be okay. Cool. Well, thank you all. You've been a great audience. Thank you for being here today, Dr. Wilkinson. This has been illuminating. Um, your uh, lectures are always very impactful. I, I told you before we got on here, I remember one from my freshman year at WVU, um, like it were yesterday. It was one on, on signifying in jazz, and maybe that's another humanities session for another time. Um, if you liked this presentation and you want to see more like it, please fill out the survey that we've put in the, the chat on Zoom and then the comments on Facebook. Uh, the more people that we can get to fill those out, the better it is for the Augusta Heritage Center, the better it is for the West Virginia Humanities Council, and it helps all these entities bring more programming like this uh, to the state of West Virginia. Thinking about, uh, speaking of bringing programming to the state of West Virginia, the Augusta Heritage Center is generously sponsored by the uh, National Endowment for the Arts, the West Virginia Department of Arts, Culture, and History, the West Virginia Humanities Council, and Davis and Elkins College. And we'd love to thank our sponsors for um, helping us steady the ship through some rough waters. We'd also like to thank you, the participants that stick with us through these virtual events and uh, you know, Emily and I are dedicated to bringing a robust cultural series to you in your own home while we need to and um, throwing the biggest West Virginia dance party we can uh, when it is safe to do so. We'd also like to thank uh, the hundreds of individual contributors that have helped Augusta uh, during this very trying time. You, you guys truly are the backbone and the reason why we do what it is um, that we do. This is the beginning of a big week at Augusta. After this, we'll flip over into some old time music. Tomorrow on Zoom and Facebook Live, we'll have a performance, uh, an October old time round robin uh, with performances by Rachel Eddy, Ben Townsend, Carl Jones, uh, Aaron Marshall, Brad Kalodner, and uh, Emily Shad. And Emily and I will also be there. Uh, the um, following night, we'll have a jam play along uh, on YouTube and on our Facebook page. It'll be hosted by uh, Rachel Eddy and Emily Hammond. And then uh, the following evening, Friday evening, we're going to get together in a house party and all participate and swap songs together. That will not be on Facebook Live. That'll just be a house party here on Zoom. And then Saturday evening, 
Uh, we've been hard at work compiling um, material from the archive to, hi to highlight and celebrate Fiddler's Reunion Pass. Every year in October, Augusta hosts a wonderful event called the Fiddler's Reunion. It invites um, players from all over the state and culture bearers from right here in West Virginia to uh, show their craft and play tunes. And uh, we could not do that this year. It was not safe to do so. So what we have done is gone through the archive and put together a spotlight reel of some of the fiddlers uh, that have um, had profound impact on the generation that's out playing today. So if you like this and want more of it, please fill out that survey. You can find us at the Augusta Heritage Center. Um, the email is AugustaHeritageCenter at dwv.edu. We've got a new website for now. It's called AugustaArtsAndCulture.org. Um, and we are beginning to start a robust series of winter lessons and also um, continuing with these humanities sessions throughout the winter. I have a feeling that um, we're all going to need to connect with each other this winter. Um, I don't like the term socially distant. I think that we need to be physically distant but socially very connected during this time. And so we'll use whatever tools are at our disposal and right now that's Zoom and Facebook and YouTube uh, to be able to connect with each and every one of you. And I don't know about you but it's very fulfilling to see everybody's face on a thumbnail because my days have been pretty solitary as of late. So getting together even like this feels very special. So with that, Emily, Dr. Wilkinson, we'll thank you guys very much. And uh, we'll see you later this week. Come and join us sometime. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bye-bye.